Lego Hobo 910 here with another Lego video. And in this video, I'm reviewing set number 71043, the Lego Harry Potter Hogwarts Castle. This is the second largest set ever. Only second to the Millennium Falcon, the Ultimate Collector Series Millennium Falcon, if we're going in piece count. And this set is in micro scale, as you can see by the massive number of micro figures there, as well as coming with four exclusive minifigures for the house founders, and obviously the main Hogwarts castle, as well as other side builds such as the boats to bring the first years to Hogwarts, Hagrid's hut, and the Whomping Willow with the flying car. And I've seen lots of people complaining that it's micro scale, saying it be full scale. What's, what's up with that and being really annoyed by that? But a great logic I've seen for that is the biggest... Uh, Hogwarts custom mock ever is like, I think, 200,000 pieces. But in case you're wondering, is $2,000, and that's only half scale. So if you were to get it full scale, it'd be at least $4,000, and absolutely massive if it was accurate minifigure scale. So I think doing micro scale is just excellent, and this is a very large beautiful display piece for $400, and it comes in an absolutely massive box, and LEGO actually has a limit to buying two of them at a time off of LEGO.com. You can't buy more, which I think is kind of funny. So let's get right into the review. We're going to look at some of the side builds there, as well as the plinth, and then the micro figures, and we're going to just look at the Minifigures is one of the first things, whereas normally I save minifigures for last, since the set is mostly based on the actual build here. We're gonna save mini figure. We're uh, gonna do mini figures at the beginning. So let's get right into the review. Set. I just want to kind of show you the packaging that this comes in. Talk a little bit about that because it comes in a box this big, and right now you can't see any of that box because it is so massive. Here it is, as you can see. It actually breaks out of the top of my recording studio. Here is my hand in comparison to it, just showing you how big it is. And I actually find this big box rather useful, because then I can use it to store boxes for my other Harry Potter sets. And something interesting that I've never seen done on any other LEGO set is having a box inside a box. It has this relatively plain white box with just some serial numbers on it, and this was just sitting in the very bottom, and they stored a lot of bags on top of this box, and then in it was the other half of the bags. And this comes with 37 bags, and in a second I'll be showing you what 37 Lego bags looks like. And it also has an absolutely massive amount of stickers. There's the main sticker sheet, and that's pretty average for large sets. That's about how much my Batcave has. And yeah, like I said, that's just one sticker sheet. We also have this second sticker sheet, and a third sticker sheet. And I actually lost the fourth sticker sheet, but it's just another one this size. And something kind of interesting that happened to me, that won't happen to the majority of you, is I had a bit of a problem with the packaging. You know how large instruction books are, they have their own bag, which is sealed at the end? Well, I ended up getting a second of this sticker sheet, and you are only supposed to have one, so I just kind of got an extra one. Except these two stickers for the Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw houses were often were kind of sealed in the packaging, and this was kind of cut through and attached to the packaging, and the packaging was ripped open. Uh, luckily, we didn't need to call customer support because, like I said, you're only supposed to have one of these, and that's what that is. So, it's just kind of a neat little experience. I wouldn't worry too much about it happening to your package. I haven't heard anything else about it happening. It's just rare occurrence of Lego screwing up. And... Yeah, so I basically just get this extra rip sticker sheet with a few extra stickers, which is kind of a neat thing to have laying around. So now I'm going to show you what a massive amount of Lego bags looks like. Massive amount of bags this set generates. 37 set bags, as well as the small bags that come in those bags. And then bags for such things as the instruction book and the stickers. I'm going to pour out this giant pile of bags, which was obnoxious to clean up. So... And that's only after the bags have been condensed, as you can see. They are kind of squished and condensed as I shove them in the bag. When I first uh, was just throwing these on my floor as I was building the set, they took up a lot more space. Actions are redded and those bags are cleaned up. I can look at the minifigures here. We can start actually looking at the set. 
This is a little plinth for these four very exclusive minifigures that you're definitely not going to be able to get in any other way. And they're probably never going to make any other versions of these. These are the four house founders for Hogwarts. Godric Gryffindor, Helena Hufflepuff, Salazar Slytherin, and Rowena Ravenclaw. They each have their own house appropriately displayed down there with a sticker on the correct color background as well as on this little plinth to help display them. And each minifigure just stands on some jumper plates to kind of set them back so they aren't hugging up directly against the sign for their house. And now we're going to look at each of the minifigures individually. First up, we have Godric Gryffindor, and he has the Sword of Gryffindor by his side there, as well as his wand in the medium reddish-brown color. Each of the House Founders has one of the ten main wand colors, the medium reddish-brown, the dark brown, the dark tan, and the black. The only wand color that we've seen so far that has not been represented is white, but they're keeping that exclusive to Voldemort. And he has a pretty awesome flowing hairpiece, as well as what I believe is an exclusive beard, which it does come with an extra of. His printing on the front there is pretty fantastic, carries down into the legs. And then he has one of the older style capes, so I'm going to need to take off the cape, the beard, and the hair so you can see his head and the rest of his printing better. He is without the beard, hair, and cape, and his face kind of reminds me of the Gandalf face they used in the Lord of the Rings line. You can also see a bit of the front printing better with kind of the golden cross medallion, as well as a bit of printing to kind of represent the cape coming over his shoulders. And if we turn him around there, you can see the back printing where there really isn't much going on. But overall, he looks really great, especially when you, you know, put all the stuff on him that you're supposed to, and he's not hairless and capeless. Take a closer look at Helena Hufflepuff here. Something I thought you should know is you get each of the house founders in one of the four instruction books. You get Gryffindor in the first instruction book, in fact, in the first bag. Then you get Hufflepuff in the second instruction book, Salazar Slytherin in the third, and Helena Hufflepuff in the fourth, and they don't always come in the first bag of that instruction book, they just come in a random bag. Well, it's not random, it's the same bag no matter what set you get, but it's just kind of a bag in the middle, except for Gryffindor, he comes in the first one. So now, let's look at Helena Hufflepuff for her accessories. She has, of course, Hufflepuff's cup, and her wand is in dark brown. As you can see, she uses one of the new robe-slash-dress pieces, which, in case you didn't know, they replaced for a normal slope, because these actually connect better where they have, like, the same pegs as... Uh, minifigure legs, whereas the just slopes that they used to use just had studs so it didn't connect as securely. And also, this way it's the same height as minifigure legs, plus it just looks better. And then it, they also print on the back more commonly now, which we will see with Hufflepuff here. For the front printing, it's pretty fantastic there. Once again, transfers down fairly well. Her face printing there is just a simple smile. And then she has this hairpiece that I 90% sure isn't exclusive to her. I think I've seen it before. And if we take it off, you can see her second face. And I'll put it on there. And in the second face, she is just smiling more happily. A kind of larger smile. Looks kind of mischievous with the one eyebrow raised. And she once again has the older style cape, which I'm just going to fold up. And there's the back printing, and they print it on the back of the robe piece, and it kind of transfers down very nicely with the rope connecting down. There is a bit of gappage, but that's to be expected when you're trying to have continuous prints between two pieces. It's just never going to come out perfectly. There's always going to be a bit of gap. Overall, Helena Hufflepuff here looks pretty fantastic. third house founder here, we have Salazar Slytherin, of course, of Slytherin House, and he comes with the dark nougat wand, I mean, uh, dark tan, excuse me, and he has a pretty commonly used generic beard piece there, which then covers the majority of the front printing, which we'll take a closer look at later, obviously, because you can't see any of it, and then he also has the double cape combo, where it's like the mini cape and the long cape to create the hood. And once again, you can't see back printing, so we need to take off quite a lot in order to see all of his printing. Able to see all of his printing better, and his face doesn't look quite as mean and cruel when it's exposed as it does when he has the beard on, because it kind of covers his mouth. And as you can see, he has a locket there, as well as 
some weird kind of wavy stripes going down his robes, but then a bit of a kind of collar there with shiny little golden speckles, which continues around to the back. There isn't really much going on on the back, but it's going to be mostly covered by the evil cape combo, who has a fairly common hairpiece and then her wand in black. On her face printing there, you can see that she is, of course, wearing her diadem. And then there's little silver sparkles going down the robe, as well as when the robe kind of opens up to reveal an under robe at the bottom, there's a little pattern of kind of fluidly hook looking things. And if we take off the hair piece, and she also uses the new robe piece, she has, you can see her face printing there a bit better. And if we turn around, there is her other face, which appears to be slightly misaligned. Kind of the same problem that they've been having with Hermione figures. And yeah, the printing carries on to the back. In this face, she's looking a bit more stern, though. Comes with 24 unique micro figures that are printed to represent various characters here, which we're going to take a quick gander through. It also comes with five Dementors, which once again, we'll see a bit later. And then a few colorless, which so just some kind of plain, unprinted ones, which represent various statues and such around the castle. So, here we have Albus Dumbledore, Minerva McGonagall, Severus Snape, Remus Lupin, Dolores Umbridge, Argus Filch, Voldemort, or He Who Shall Not Be Named, Bellatrix Lestrange, Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, Hermione Granger, and then supposedly three random Gryffindor students, but that first one is obviously supposed to be Neville, and then it's, I'm guessing that it's maybe supposed to represent Ginny, and then I'm not sure. We move on to our four Slytherins, where we have Draco Malfoy, then three random Slytherins. We are then also supposed to believe that those are three random Ravenclaws, even though the first one with the blonde hair is clearly Luna, and then just two randoms. And then we have three random Hufflepuffs. Overall, like I said earlier, 24 micro figures. Quite a nice array of characters to get to populate your castle. Comes with five of these little boat builds, which are built using a window frame here, as you can see with a cheese slope on top. And they are just connected with friction to the studs. And you can only fit one minifigure in each boat, even though there are four studs, since the side is being connected with that. You can just put one minifigure in between the various studs. You could put more if you didn't properly connect them. But then these boats with the little lamps on the front can carry your students to Hogwarts. But before we actually start looking at Hogwarts, there are still a few more things to look at. We have this tiny version of the Whomping Willow. Here is it compared to a minifigure. As you can see, everything is super tiny. And here it is compared to a micro figure. We'll just use this guy. And it also comes with these, uh, this tiny little flying car. And as you can see, it's the Whomping Willow. There's a tree trunk, and then branches that come off with spikes on the end to whack unsuspecting students and cars. And you can just rest this little tiny four-piece flying car, which uses a roller skate piece for the wheels. I've heard a lot of people praising how well it stays in the tree, except I can't find out how to do it. It just kind of sits there, but then if you spin it at all, it very easily falls out. And yes, it can spin quite fast, actually. It also has a few little uh, tiles there to represent the tunnel at the bottom of the Whomping Willow Castle. There's one final small build to look at. This is Hagrid's Hut. It, of course, has the two-cylinder design. They don't quite connect in the center there, but I think it's close enough to, you know, get the point across that they're connected. It also has Hagrid's little pumpkin patch here. And in the back, they have Aragog, and they use a dark nougat spider piece, and that's pretty well scaled to your micro figures, except the only problem is I think it's really off on color, because Aragog is really dark. If they wanted to use an existing color, they could use black or they could use a dark brown, but the dark nougat doesn't really fit for me. Overall, it uses some interesting building techniques with using the kind of eight-sided uh, clip connector and then having pieces that fold up. It's a very interesting build. And it also looks great and easily gets the point across and looks a lot like Hagrid's stuff. Before we get up close and inside and take a closer look, I just want to say this thing's absolutely massive. Here is my hand compared to it, and it's rather stretched out. And I think even though they did not include some of the towers in the back and some other places, 
this really gets the point across, with especially including some of the big important shapes, such as the Great Hall and the tower next to it, and the main bridge leading across. And it's divided into two sections, which I'll show you in half a second. But this is a great collector's piece, first of all, because it looks amazing on shelves. From far away, you can really appreciate the scale. From close up, you can really appreciate the detail and care put into this. And if you don't like have a room specifically for Lego like I do, and you're not a super huge Lego fan, but you just buy this because it looks cool, you can set it somewhere in your house, and it'd probably be a great conversation piece. And now I'm going to show you how this splits, so that way I can review it better. It splits into two parts there, right at the center, into this section, which is built in instruction books 1 and 2, and that section, which is built in instruction books 3 and 4. So we're going to start by looking at this section, then that section. This one is definitely taller, and this section also has more bags, which probably means more pieces are used here, whereas that one is a lot more spread out, kind of creating the large floor plan of this first section. Throughout the review, you'll be seeing many of the micro figures stationed about, so that way you can kind of get a sense of scale and see how things interact with the micro figures. And as you can see, this tower is absolutely humongous, and these two sections are fairly easy to carry without much worry of them breaking. They have very strong bases using lots of these big ugly rock pieces, as well as lots of Technic beams and such running throughout the base, giving it a very sturdy feeling. The only thing that kind of worries me whenever I carry it is this tower. As you can see, it, the top has a bit of wobble in it, and the entire thing has a bit of wobble, which scares me. Obviously, you can fix some of that by just, you know, making sure they're pushed down hard, but this section as well on the top of the tower does come off fairly easily, as it's built in a separate assembly, then smushed on. I think they could have improved by, you know, building just the slightest bit on, and then pushing it down, then building the rest on top. That might have made it a bit harder to build, but it would definitely help make it easier to connect and keep the build a lot more stable. We have this tower from here at the boathouse, and it's fairly simplistic build, with then this spire, which is kind of ob y You build this in the first bag, and some of the earliest bags, but then, oddly, you build this section in the final bag of this half of Hogwarts, and then connect it on there. I don't know why you don't build that till the end. Maybe because when you're building, you're very likely to, you know, knock it off like that. I'm... That's something that you see throughout this whole set, is little spires that get very easily knocked off all the time. So that's something to be a little wary of. And as you can see, there's some of the kind of jut-outs from the plates that have rails on the side. And it makes it impossible to actually place minifigures in there, because they can't really stand on either side. I guess you could connect them, you know, in between the studs, like you do on the boats, except that's really hard to do, especially with the small space. As you can see, it's kind of hard to reach a finger in there, as well as have the dexterity to hold a micro figure and pose them at the same time. Also, if we look in the back, I'm going to shine a bit of light in there. It's really hard to see. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to catch it, but there, there we go. You can see faintly there's a sticker there that has four crests, which are supposed to obviously represent the for Hogwarts houses, and then there is no real opening in the back of the boathouse to lead up to the stairs here, which just use a bunch of 1x2 slopes, and as you can see, they, they kind of get the point across of stairs, them winding up the uh, mountain with the slopes, except they're, they obviously don't have many stair markings, except that's really hard to do at this scale, and I've just stationed a Slytherin student there on the stairs. And then you come up to the courtyard, which uses some new unique pieces. It has these window frames, which are pretty standard. But then inside it just has a generic window insert, which is clear. But then some printing of tan on there to get those lines. And the, the, the clear part is supposed to be just air negative space. It's representing all the different loops and crazy pillars on there. They also leave some blank throughout for archways to enter and exit various places of an upper view of the courtyard, and as you can see, it uses some of these slope pieces for the overhang, and then they use a kind of interesting technique to make the corners work, where they use the 
one by one plates, and then they use some of these pieces where it goes down and cuts at a diagonal, and put them together to create the corners, which makes them very smooth, and I'm impressed with the corners. There is the little bit of bump, which you can kind of see there and back there from the cheese slope, obviously, I mean, not the cheese slope, excuse me, the one by one, not slanting like the others, except it, it's smooth enough and as smooth as they could get. Also, something that's kind of hard to see that I'm going to have to turn around here is those little benches back there, which are just a couple studs with then a 1x2 tile on it. And now if we go back over here, you can see in the entrance way there, there is a golden micro figure on a plinth, which is a statue representing the architect of Hogwarts. And you do get an extra one of those, as well as the white and black figures that we will see later. And I'm just going to shine a bit more light in there. There are lots of instances like this where it's kind of arch and small spaces that's hard to see. Those are some stickers back there on the doors, which can open inward. And then up there, we have the clock area, which has some stickers back there for the kind of lacings. And then another sticker for the clock. And that sticker is actually identical to the sticker in the Great Hall. At least I'm 90% sure. I don't believe there's any difference. If you know if there is, point it out to me. There is also a little bit of walk space over here, and this kind of odd area that I originally thought was going to be built into a tower, except it gets weird and cut off. That's actually where the large bridge connects later on. It also has some little kind of walk space over here. There's kind of a big weird blank courtyard area, and I don't remember that ever being in Harry Potter, except I think it works out because they couldn't really put anything else there. It's just kind of a weird, awkward space. So, like I said earlier, you can open these doors inward. So now let's take a quick peek at the outside of the Great Hall, and then we'll go in. Technique for stained glass there with some grill plates and then tiles behind it. And when you get some light shining through, it looks especially amazing. They also have, of course, some cones at the top here to even it out. There is also some stained glass in the back there, except it since that area isn't hollow like it is over here, it doesn't really shine as much. They also have these little lanterns around the walkway there. Plus, then they have some tooth plates to create the little spikes on the roof. And if we look up, there is the kind of main center tower, which has kind of a weird-looking tall roof. I think the roof became a little too tall and skinny. Then you also have the other smaller towers on either side. And here are the five Dementors. They are just a recolor of the Emperor Palpatine hologram. It is the slightest bit bigger than a minifigure, as you can, I mean, a micro figure. And then it also has a stud on the bottom so they can connect to these clear antenna and fly around Hogwarts menacingly, ready to capture the prisoner of Azkaban. And then also over here we have a little bit of a spire. And there's also some kind of thicker stained glass windows where it's two wide instead of one and then a bit more stained glass by the entrance. So now let's go to the inside of the Great Hall. Here we have the Great Hall, and there are the doors which we just entered. Hanging above are the four house banners, and they are not double-sided, and since the piece they use has anti-studs on the back. You can also see the technique for the stained glass a bit better. They use some transparent headlight bricks laid on the side with then plates connected to them, and then over there, we have a sticker on this panel to show all of Umbridge's decrees. And then there are the four house tables running side by side like they should. And my sister says they look kind of like Kit Kats, which I can see. My one gripe with these is that you can't actually have students standing properly and being connected to studs, as they are on one by, I mean, uh, two by two jumpers. There's just tile space between them, so they just kind of sit there and can easily fall out and slide, and it's just... It's just kind of annoying to get students actually set up there. And then we have the staff table over here, which has a few stickers behind it. One to represent the house point counter, and a few to represent the windows, since the back windows, like I said, are filled and are not hollow. And then the staff table has some steps leading up to it. And then they use some neck brackets for chairs attached to jumper plates. And there's, like, just enough space to connect on stair number... I mean, uh, chair number one, three, and five. Those other ones, they're actually just connected to normal studs. So you can't connect. The other ones are connected to jumpers, though, which gives just the slightest bit of space to connect, except it's not a very strong connection. So there are a few problems in the Great Hall here with seating, but it at least looks very nice. 
And something I sh think I should point out is kind of why these exist, and also how they got the tiny arches there, is they actually created new pieces for this set. They have one where it's just a one by one with then half uh, bricks sticking off on either side for the arch, and then another one that's a corner. So they obviously had to have corners to finish some arches over here. So then they kind of stuck off weirdly there. And they actually use these arches to fill, try to fill in a gap there, because they had to use some slopes there. So then the gap, they, they used that to kind of fill it in. And that's also why throughout the build you're going to kind of see some of these nubs sticking off and other odd things such as that. Under the Great Hall here is the Chamber of Secrets. And for the Basilisk there, it uses one of the new snake pieces in Sand Green. The only other uh, place this piece can be found is in the Harry Potter CMF series with Voldemort, where it's an olive green snake and it has printed eyes. Now, you could say they didn't print the eyes because, oh, laziness, but I'm saying it's because, you know, fox happens, and this can rotate around slightly. It's just connected by a clip on a stud, so if you rotate it around too much, it will break off. It then uses some of these kind of snake head pieces for the statues, even though the statue should cut off about there. It, I think this gets the point across well. It also has a singular black tile there for Tom Riddle's diary. And in the back, you can see there's quite an array of stickers and some well-chosen pieces to create the giant statue of Slytherin that the snake comes out of. It also uses some dark blue for the various pools of water. Over to the left of the chamber, there's just this simple little room, which is an entrance to the Chamber of Secrets. Basically, I think the reason they put this here is because there was this small little area, and there really wasn't anything they could put in here, so they decided they might as well just throw this in. It just has one sticker, which was kind of hard to apply, it being a disc sticker. Used some interesting technique pieces all throughout there, but then it just creates a little door there, so you could imagine they enter here, and then there's a tunnel leading back to over here. But overall, I think it was just to use that space, and I think they used it well enough. Two rooms devoted to moving staircases. And as you can see, they can just swivel around on a turntable. They use some Technic tooth gear pieces there. You cannot actually kind of set a micro figure there. You can set them on the floor, though. And there's two giant stickers for paintings, which are hard to apply, except I thought they were going to be a lot harder than they are. Just going to give you kind of a quick look at some of the various paintings. And then we have a second level, which has different stickers for the paintings, so I'll take you up there. Second story, and as you can see, there are some more paintings. Back there is one of my favorite paintings. It is a simple painting of a knight, which I don't think it's meant to represent. I'm forgetting the name right now, but it's a knight painting that's only in the book. They never mention it in the movie. It's, I believe, prominent in the fourth. It's a knight painting that helps Harry a bit, but is also kind of bothersome. I believe, I don't think it's meant to represent that, but that's how I like to imagine it. And also something I might as well point out right now, is, as you can see, these are just using big panel pieces to create the interiors. Except then the exterior uses lots of bricks with studs on the side to create this detailed look. It also does use some stickers for windows, but mostly it's just one by one black transparent, uh, plates, and lots of slopes and stuff to create all that effect. I'll give you a bit of a better look at that after I go through the inside fully. Next up, we have a bathroom here. As you can see, I didn't quite get those stickers perfectly lined up, but like I said, these stickers are kind of hard to get lined up. They're easy to apply, easier than I thought at least, but they're hard to get lined up. But yeah, this is meant to represent the bathroom. It's kind of a conglomeration of Moaning Myrtle's bathroom, as you can see from Moaning Myrtle back there, as well as the design of the sink. It's also a combination of the Prefect's bathroom, as you can see by the mermaid stained glass. And yeah, it's just a simple little build for the sinks in the center here. I do think they could have benefited by switching the bathroom with the bottom staircase room, so that way the bathroom actually does directly lead into the Chamber of Secrets. But, oh well, they didn't. It looks really cool as a room individually. I just wish they would have switched it down. Final room in this main tower, we have Dumbledore's office, and first at the very base here, they used a little alcove to create the gold phoenix statue, which the stairs would rise up around to reach into his office. There isn't any mechanism or any build for the stairs reaching up around, except I like that they did put thought into including the phoenix. And then up there is Dumbledore's actual office. And first I'm just going to point out this has a lot of stickers, as you can see there's some paintings above there. 
And then also, in the back, there is a sticker for the main window as well as some other contraptions and such. Over there you have a sticker, one which is just kind of a little bookcase, and one which has some paintings and also a perch for Fox the Phoenix. There is his desk as well as it uses a neck bracket for a chair as well. There's a bit of golden detailing back there as well. Over there on one sticker we have the Sword of Gryffindor and a painting, and the other one has the Sorting Hat and a painting. And now we're going to kind of take a look at the outside of the tower. The outside of the tower, I did briefly mention a bit earlier about how the outside comes together. It connects in five different panel sections. Three of them are large, and none of them are just duplicates. They, they all have slight differences. These two are exactly the same for the final sticker that you put on it. The rest are built in very different ways to accommodate some rock paneling at the bottom and such. But then, these were kind of hard to connect, you know, just being long panels that you have to connect at, I think, three or four connection points. And then, especially the angled ones, because not only did you have to connect it like that, they were also at angles. The roof also uses some interesting techniques, as the top is just kind of generic, you know, roof, kind of half cone pieces connected together. But then, they had to do it slightly differently to get all these smaller towers jutting off, and they did use some astromech pieces to give them a slice of the slope. And then also, because that's the biggest of the piece they have, they won't have anything big enough for this. Plus, if they do it this way, they can get some more detail, as you can see. And make you also be able to have studs to attach the Hungarian horn tail here. And this is just a small sub-assembly. It is, like I said, the Hungarian horn tail, which is the dragon that Harry has to fight in the Triwizard Tournament. We're going to take a bit of a closer look at this next. This is the Hungarian Horn Tail, the dragon that Harry fights in the fourth book in the first task. And I'm really impressed with this. It's very simple, but very effective. There are some things that look kind of funny, like the front beak jaw section. It does look slightly flat, in my opinion. But it has a large range of articulation. The head, as you can see, can move up and down. Also, if you want, I guess, you can twist individual horns. The wings can flap back and forth, as well as rotating around, since they're just connected on one stud. Though sometimes they do bump into things, such as the horns, and come off. The legs also can move. And they just use robot arms. One, as you can see, has one of those one-by-one -one studs with tiny bars connected, so it has a stud to connect to the tower. You can also rotate here at the hips, and then at the very tip of the tail. And overall, it looks very cool, and I'd say it's maybe the slightest bit out of scale, like, maybe the slightest bit too big, but I'd say it's about good, as close as they could get. And I think the more and more I look at it, the more in scale it appears to be. When I originally built it, I thought it was rather big, but overall, I think it looks pretty good, and has a great amount of articulation for something this small. Here is the second half of Hogwarts, and it connects along here. The rock working trees around the bottom are in the same style, with the exact same type of trees, and so it also has plenty more rooms than the other one. This has a lot more rooms, except a lot of them are much smaller, so let's get right into this. We're going to start by looking at the bridge, and some of the outside details. First of all, here is the main bridge that connects the sections of Hogwarts. It connects to a small section over on the other side of Hogwarts, which I might show you later if I remember. And you can then just set your micro figures on here. They don't actually connect as it uses these panel pieces, so you can just set them on there, but they will not actually connect using studs. If we get a bit of a lower angle. You actually see that there are arches on both sides, just obviously with the way these arch pieces work, they couldn't connect both of them to the one stud thick, so it just kind of has that. Then if you're not at a low enough angle and you just look at that, I think it looks fine just being able to see the front arches. It's kind of like arch square, a bit of a pattern. And it also uses these uh, window frame pieces that we've seen all throughout Hogwarts as kind of some more arch detailing. And there's been some discussion about this using a slightly legal technique, because as you can see, it's at a slight angle. If you don't know, an illegal technique is a technique that LEGO does not use in their official sets, because it either A, puts stress on the parts, or B, doesn't connect sturdy enough. And 
there's been rumors that, like, the length here isn't long enough, that it connects, and, like, when you connect it, it kind of has to jump the pieces out, and it stresses out the bridge, except I I've seen some videos on it, and I, I see what they're talking about, and I understand it, except I personally haven't come across that problem when building the set, or just, you know, using the set in general, I haven't come across any problem with this bridge, so, I don't know, there, there might be an illegal technique, but I personally don't see any problems, and in most of the videos I've seen about it, they said that it's not bad enough that it'll, like, cause your bridge to just randomly break, so it shouldn't be too big of an issue. Now if we move around the side here a bit, you can see into kind of this crevice where the bridge is. This is kind of a neat little area because it used lots of negative space, just like over here, which really gives this side of the castle, even though it uses less big pieces and such to build the base, it has a much bigger footprint just because of this use of negative space. And then it just has a few more trees, a bit more rock work down there, as well as a, another bridge back there, which we'll look at later. But then also when you disconnect it, there's a bit of an easter egg here with the Devil's Snare, which is one of the tasks from the Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone, whatever country you're from. They just use some mind pieces as the Devil's Snare, and that leads us nicely to the rest of the inside turn the castle around slightly. There's the Devil's Snare. Here's the room we are currently looking at. It is the room with the winged keys. There's Harry back there, and on the floor there's supposedly levitating, it's just held with a clip, is the broom that Harry must ride to retrieve the winged keys. It's just a singular minifigure sized paintbrush piece in plain brown. It doesn't have any paint details on the end, which I think looks really good and is perfect scale for this. Then they also use a large sticker back there for kind of some arches and make the room look a lot bigger and it has some wing keys. They also just use some stickers on some transparent pieces there to get some other wing keys. And then in the back, you have the key with the bent wing that Quirrell has already caught and that's the one Harry must catch to go through to the next room here, which is the chess room. It has, once again, a large sticker in the back just for some additional detailing. And this is just a slice of the chessboard. It is the proper eight long, but then it's only three deep instead of eight deep. And it uses one white and one black micro figure as various chess pieces. That could either be the king or the queen. It also then has cones, which I like to see as the bishop, studs for the pawns, and then I believe the cheese slopes are meant to represent knights. You could imagine them as whatever piece you want. That's just how I imagine them. And then it does use a kind of navy instead of black and white to make the floor tiles, and I'm pretty sure the navy is accurate. Overall, that room looks very nice. Then if we move around slightly once again, here is the final trial. Obviously, they cut out the trials that they cut out in the movies, such as the troll, the potions, uh, there may be a few others I'm forgetting, but they only feature the ones seen in the movies. And here is the room with the mirror of Erised. And as you can see, there is just a tiny little piece with a sticker for it, as well as flames around it. And then there's a little singular red stud to represent the Sorcerer's Stone. I'll just use Hermione here so you can see scale, because this set doesn't come with a Quirrell figure. So that's the room with the Sorcerer's Stone. There is a bit of gappage over here, kind of looking into the inside of one of those big ugly rock pieces. And then right above it is the bridge, which we'll take a quick look at before we go into more detail on the inside. The other smaller bridge, it does use the same panel technique for the top, but then it uses some interesting technique for the arches, using one of the 1x3 arches and then also a 1x4 arch there. And then it also uses some jumper plates to create that little column with the tiny little gaps, providing some pretty interesting, intricate detail. Inside, right above the rooms we looked at previously, and this room here is just kind of a large corridor with a few details. It obviously has some stickers for bricks there. And then it has one little sticker there which represents the door to the room of requirement. And the room of requirement is in a completely different area that we will look at slightly later. I think they could have improved the set by either A, putting this somewhere different near the room of requirement, or B, kind of rearranging some of the rooms to put the room of requirement near the door. But I think it works because the room of requirement is kind of magical and doesn't really obey any rules, so it could be you enter the door and get teleported way over where it is. We'll see that a bit later. And then over here we have one of my favorite parts of the set. Between those columns, there's a large sticker that says, The Chamber of Secrets has been opened, 
enemies of the air beware. It's kind of hard to see past the columns. And this is formatted very differently than it is in the movie. In the movie, it's only two lines, just longer lines. Except I think this works because instead they would have had to get like two or three stickers across. It would be even more blocked by the columns. So I think this works a lot better and it gets the correct quote so it kind of gets the point across. Now we're going to move up. Dark Arts Room. And it's kind of a combination of various years for Defense Against the Dark Arts. It's Lupin's Room because it has the grand film that he plays while they fight the Boggart in the closet back there. And it's also kind of based off of Lockhart's because of those pixies back there. Then there are some details that are just meant to represent all Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher sets, such as the dragon that hangs up and some of the various other details. But then it also kind of represents the fifth because of the room next to it, which we'll take a closer look at in just a second. This is a very kind of small but well usable room. As you can see, you can fit six students here, as there are three kind of rows of desks or three tables, which can each fit two students. And then you can also fit some characters up in the front there to either be A, your teachers, or B, you could have students up there practicing with Lupin. Overall, it's a very nice looking room. The office of everyone's least favorite defense against the dark arts teacher. In fact, everyone's least favorite teacher and the least favorite character in general. This is Dolores Umbridge's office. As you can see, pink like it should be. It has those little white studs back there to represent her decorative kitten plates. I'm glad they didn't just decide to slap a sticker back there. But instead, used some interesting techniques there with various jumper plates and such, and then use the white studs. I always like when they go physical building over stickers. They also have this large pink radar dish with a yellow stud to be her light. And then they have some little pink flower pieces to represent little kind of puffy chairs, as well as her desk, and then a neck bracket back there once again for the chair on one of the pink flowers. It also then has a small stool for the student to sit on, who she is about to torment. Over to the other side of the castle, the rooms we just looked at are over there. We're going to start with the potions room here. As you can see, it uses three stickers in the back for various detail, such as the window and arches that are always behind Snape, as well as some shelves of potions. Then also uses studs on some little built-up shelves to represent various potion ingredients. It also uses a large cauldron back there for Snape's cauldron to be demonstrated to the students, as well as some just large flask pieces. Then also has a small chair there, and then the same stool builds scattered around, the same build that was used in Umbridge's office. Then also uses an interesting technique where it has one of those transparent one-by-ones with a small bar, and then it uses a black stud uh, with hole in it, upside down to represent cauldrons for the students, as well as a sand blue tile for a book, and then some clear stud for a empty potion bottle or whatever you want to imagine. Now we're going to move on over to the next room, the room of, require room of requirement. And if I kind of tip the build up, you can see three large stickers in the back for various detail. And all those stickers kind of have various Lego objects. If you want a closer look at those stickers, I recommend you pause the video back when I lift it up, because I'm not going to hold that up for too long, because it's kind of hard to do that. And I don't want to just hold it there for 20 seconds. I want to get on with the review. And this room is just kind of scattered with all sorts of random objects. A few things that are actually meant to represent some things. is this silver goblet with a blue stud. represents the Goblet of Fire. Not exactly sure why they put it in the room of requirement. Then it also uses one of these kind of uh, one by two plates with these kind of large jut offs and some snot building to create the vanishing cabinet. They also just have some various interesting techniques to create all sorts of other things. I'm going to try to shine some more light in there. That's one problem that is all throughout Hogwarts, is there really isn't much light, especially in these underground rooms. They use some interesting builds with neck brackets there, maybe to represent those piles of chairs that you see them flying around in the seventh. And also just various studs and bricks built up. Above those rooms, we have another area which uses the same stained glass technique all around. It has two large doors which open inwards with similar stickers to the Great Halls. We'll take a closer look at those when we kind of look at some more of the detail outside. And if I move that door out of the way, you can see a sticker here on a gray panel 
which represents the painting of the fat lady to enter the Gryffindor common room. And over here on these two columns, there's kind of like a cork board with a bunch of notes, kind of like a message board, and then also a chalkboard with all sorts of drawings on it and symbols and lines. Then over here, back to the Gryffindor common room, they have a fireplace there, which is actually what the fat lady is on the opposite side. Not exactly accurate, because you don't walk into the fireplace. Then what I'm assuming is supposed to represent a lamp, as well as a few red couches, an ottoman, and a chair build using the exact same neck bracket technique as before. And then if we move on over here is the library. There's a bunch of neck bracket chairs throughout. Many of them are pushed in, as well as lots of stacks of books. Another little lamp back there. And then this large bookcase, which is just kind of a simple little build on the bottom. And then it has just a bunch of random plates and tiles to represent the books. And then a 1x4 brown to represent shelves, so on and so forth, repeat. And then, yeah, it's a very interesting build. It looks nice, and it represents the library well. Before we kind of finish out the review... We're just going to take a bit of a closer look at some of the outside details, starting with the archway over here, which leads to the hallway, where the Chamber of Secrets message has been written, and there's the door to the room requirement. And it uses some headlight bricks reversed to kind of create those windows, as well as some interesting techniques with using normal inverted slopes, as well as headlight bricks with cheese slopes to kind of get a constant slant, but at varying slopes. And directly above that, on the rather steep roof line, there is a small chimney, and then this kind of small tower design, which uses those telescopes to hold it up, as well as having the spire on top, which you will see all throughout. This one uses a gray cone with then sand green spire, as well as most of the smaller towers. The bigger towers use a sand green cone, as you have seen over at the Great Hall area as well. And then on Dolores Umbridge's office tower here, it uses some similar techniques there for that they used at the Great Hall Tower with the paneling on the outside, except that one's slightly more complex. And then here it uses some interesting techniques with clips and those pieces that are often used for Spider-Man to hold the web, the one by one with bar on the end, and then use those to get those angles as well as this cool roof line. Then there's a smaller tower connected here which uses 2x2 two two rounds with holes in them, and it uses those to connect to the tower, but they also serve a purpose as being windows. It then has an astromech body at the bottom to kind of slope it out and give it a bit more of a point. It's kind of hard to see that from a higher angle. Then over here is the large main building where you have the various... Uh, the common room and the library, as well as the hallway. This area uses some similar techniques as Umbridge's office to create the ring around the towers, except it uses some of these tooth plates as well as some larger pieces as these are larger towers. Also along the base, it has some of these window pieces worked in, which we saw in the courtyard, which makes some of these techniques kind of interesting to build, where you have uh, it built up normally, like right here, but then you have to build it completely differently there. And if we were actually to kind of open up these towers and take a peek inside, you'd see all sorts of crazy blue and orange and white parts. Those towers were very interesting to build. Then over here, you can see some of the stained glass, as well as this large stained glass window, circular stained glass window, in the center of these two little spires. And this uses some very interesting techniques to create these large slopes. And then inside you can see there's a red, a green, a yellow, and a blue stud, which creates the circle in there in the stained glass window. Yeah, this uses some interesting snot builds, which is then connected with clips on the inside to the roof. And the roof is also kind of an interesting build, getting these corners right using some of these odd pieces, the same one used to create the vanishing cabinet door, as well as plenty of just normal slope pieces. A bit of a nitpick, though, is that this doesn't perfectly line up with the roof line. As you can see, there is a bit of a ledge back there, like, especially up here, down here. There's a little bit of a ledge, but when you get down here, it's more flush. But that's just a slight nitpick. I understand getting geometry with these types of things is really hard. And then, 
we need to get a slightly higher view to look at the tips of the towers, but before we do that, I'm going to actually take you down to get a better look at those doors I said we would look at a bit closer later. Yeah, there's those sticker doors within the little lamps. These are slightly bigger than the doors in the Great Hall, and they open inward as I showed you before. Two front towers use the same large pieces as the top of Umbridge's tower and the top of the main tower by the Great Hall. But then these back towers are a bit more interesting. Oops, just knock a tree off, I'll fix that later. But we turn around here, you can see these tower the tips of the towers that I think kinda look like squid heads, I would say. They're very long and triangular. They do kind of spin because they're just attached with some bars. As you can see, the towers end approximately the same height. But these are much taller and also a lot thinner. They use some of these large pieces, which are more commonly seen in boats and large cars and such. As well as then just some slope building along the side, using some interesting techniques with lots of headlight bricks and bricks with studs on the side. And then, once again, ending in the all too familiar tip that we see everywhere. These two are exactly the same. And here's just a kind of quick look at the towers. They use lots of large panel pieces. There's nothing really too interesting going on down there. This set is a behemoth, as I've said before. It's $400 in the second biggest set ever. This is definitely not a play set and definitely not for young children. This is a giant collector set for people who are really passionate about, one, Harry Potter and its universe, and two, Lego. This is just amazing. It's a giant, hard-to-build collector's piece. The box says 16+, plus, and obviously, always take those with a grain of salt, because you don't need to be 16 to build this, but it is quite a challenging build. And for any of you who are curious, I got this kind of late at night when it showed up one day, and built for a few hours that night. The next day was basically non-stop building. I obviously took breaks to eat and take care of myself and just the occasional break because building a Lego set for the entire day is kind of tiring. And then about half a day the next day to build it. So in total it took me about two days of almost full building, obviously, you know, sleeping and meals. So I'd say in total I estimate it to be maybe about like 16 hours of build time. This this is insane to build. It's quite a process. It is many crazy techniques, but it's really fun. And I'd say personally to me, the $400 for this is worth it. But that's obviously different for various people. If you can't afford it, don't go out and buy it just because I said it's amazing and I really love it. Obviously make your own smart, educated decisions on buying this. But I think $400 is worth it. It's a crazy amazing collector set with many unique stickers and prints as well as four unique minifigures that will probably never be in any other set ever again. Not even different variations of them and all sorts of crazy stuff and it's just amazing to look at. When you're far away you can really appreciate the size and the scale of this giant set and then when you get closer you can appreciate all the fine details and hard work that went into this set. I'm going to stop ranting now and just close off with saying I freaking love this set. It's awesome. It's crazy to look at. That's all. And peace.